Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Third and Fourth Angels Ministries. We want to thank everyone for being present. And those who are present, please get your pads and also your papers so you can take notes. And for those of you that do have your phones, please uh, kindly turn them off so that we do not get distracted by others. At this time, we would like to enter into the sanctuary. Let us have a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we want to praise you. Holy, holy Yeshua. As the day comes to an end, we ask for our names to be written in the book of life and blotted out of the book of iniquity by your holy blood. Jesus, we ask for your blessings on the equipment, the recording. Be with those who are volunteering to take part in this recording. Bless this sanctuary and bless the words of my mouth and meditation of my mind be directed by you. And while I am preaching, I am hearing you as well. For thy glory and for thy sake we ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and we will be viewing chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the experience of conversion for each one of us. And just because I want to read it again, I'm going to ask for your permission. Is that okay? Thank you. Once again, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? Our Father who art in heaven, bless us with thy Holy Spirit and your love this evening. Bless this message, that it may go to all your people who are preparing for your second coming. It is our prayer in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Who has also sealed us? Heavenly Father, you are so glorious and so righteous. In behalf of the third and fourth angels' messages, they were given to us by John the Baptist. No, but he was preaching it, who was... Dictating it was actually John who was actually imprisoned in the island of Patmos. For those who are ordering books, feel free to give us a call. And also, if you like to email us, continue to do so. And bear with us. We're shorthanded. We will get back with you with your orders. And for those that are paying through PayPal, feel free to continue. And, uh, of course, we've made it to where there's a specific date throughout the week where all the books will be in packages will be sent out. So... Bear with us because it's better to send it all at one time instead of sending it in various times. So all orders will go out specifically in one day. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to present the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, BEM, Trinity. This issue has grown to the extent, ladies and gentlemen, that our books have been changed. And if we can look at the screen here to my right, as we were sharing earlier, that from 2003, Walter Weiss had wrote a letter to the Biblical Research Department who was in control of the teachings and the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. By the year of 2010, the General Conference session, there was matters that were taking place in regards to the transition of the belief that finally fell through, and Elder Walter Weiss was finally given information where the Seventh-day Adventist Church no longer believes that the Prophet Alan G. White is the prophet of the remnant church. They have denied it, your Seventh-day Adventist church officials. Also, they have rejected testimonies, volumes 1 through 9, which are books of a new order. Those are not the original books. So as we look at the screen, <clears throat> when testimonies numbers 1 through 30 were being printed, it was in the year 1855, and it ended in 1881. <coughs> Excuse me. By the year 2015, we come to the rejection when they rejected testimonies, volumes 1 through 9, books of a new order, and they rejected Alan G. White being the prophet of the remnant. This is what occurred in 2015 at the general conference session under the table. And of course, there were many officials that were present, and two years later, Pastor David Gates realized what had happened, and he found the information and what had occurred, which shocked the daylights out of him and many, many people. Ladies and gentlemen, as we continue here, we'd like to share with us that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has rejected all the messages. 
rejected experience and views, 1851, rejected the prophecies in 1855, testimonies to the church, and of course, once again, 1851, they rejected experience and views. By 1858, they rejected the Great Controversy. Eight, twelve years later, they rejected Spirit of Prophecy, volumes one through four, began to be printed in 1870. And by the year 1884, they rejected the Great Controversy, 1884. They had a pastoral meeting prior to the 1888 conference, and they rejected the feast, the Moedims, in the year 1887. Ladies, they rejected everything. And by the way, gentlemen, these pastors were following suit in regards to what they were to preach. When we come down to 1888, which is much information that's built up here, I will not speak on that this evening. However, we know that Alan G. White was transferred to Australia. They asked her to they had her leave to Australia. Now, let me share with us this. By the year 1890, Ellen G. White they gave a powerful sermon, a powerful sermon, and she began to preach on the latter rain, and it was intellectual. And ladies and gentlemen, the early rain and the latter rain is not about emotions. It's not about banging the drums. It's not about hallelujah, although hallelujah is correct, but it's not about all this stuff. Okay? Now, when she preached... And she found out what was taking place. By 1900, she returned back from Australia. And by 1991, excuse me, 1900, she returned from Australia. And by 1901, she gave a sermon that, electrified, that was electrified in that tabernacle. I mean, she preached and she let them have it for all the heirs that they were doing. And they all said, Glory, Hallelujah. But stay with me. By the year of 1891, we come down to where the latter rain was being given. But Ellen White didn't realize it that when she was preaching in 1890, she finally realized that she was preaching the latter rain. And it was confirmed. However, they rejected the messages. When we come down in November 22nd, 1892, they rejected the loud cry. They rejected the latter rain. They rejected the loud cry. Ladies and gentlemen, out of all that we see here on the bulletin board, for those of you that do remember the last study we were having, they rejected everything. When we come down to 1888, they signed their own death decree. This is what was occurring. Now, the General Conference has already rejected Alan G. White being the prophet of, and the messenger of the Remnant Church. And by 18, excuse me, 2015, they also rejected testimonies. Those are books of a new order. They're actually nine volumes. They were all printed in the year 1948. They are the 18, or excuse me, the 1948 editions. All you have to do is turn the pages, and you'll see 1948, 1948, 1948. Now, I want to share something with us and give you some homework. In Testimonies, Volume 5, there's a cheat sheet that I will give you from page 20. Testimonies, Volume 5, their book, page 20 to page 98, is the Battle Creek Letters. And on page 63, it says thus, In this time, comma, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church, Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, ladies and gentlemen, what comes out? The gold comes out. And what stays in the church is the dross, the people. Once again, in this time, comma, the gold is separated from the dross in the church. That's what comes out. And she gave it in 1863. Now, let me share this. In 1863, the church was organized. By the year of October 2nd, 1868, Jesus Christ leaves the church and the Holy Spirit is quenched. The officials and the people. And not all the blame goes to the officials and the people, members. Now, the Holy Spirit has never returned back to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You might have seen it growing. It's all over the world, etc., etc. All over the world, yes, with apostasy. 
He goes, books of a new order came in and crept in and rewrote first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the third angel's message. And to top it off, the third angel's message was rejected. It was rejected. They rejected the sanctuary message, they rejected the law, they rejected the Sabbath, and they rejected the third angel's message. You can read that in the 1884. Or better yet, for you and also those who are present, if you have the great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels, comparing the 1911 and the 1884 great controversy, you will find everything that they did in here in these chapters. You will find the third angel's message rejected. Read that for your life and you will see the answers that have been given in there, but they were omitted from all the other great controversies that are revised editions that are not correct. This is why you have all the scholars, all the pastors, and all these people within our denomination, ladies and gentlemen, in South Support and Ministries, quoting from the 1911-1888. Ellen White had nothing to do with that. This is what they did. Now, I, sh I share this this evening in kindness and in love. It's taken me my lifetime to, to gather this information. And I'm not the only one, brothers and sisters. There's many of them, but they've been put to sleep. And there's only a few of us left. So what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, is we're trying to organize the correct truth and present it to you as it was presented from the prophet. So if you didn't have an experience with those that had an experience, 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 they're all passed away, only a few left. Then we got to go to the original books and pull out all of that information and now give it to you. However, this evening we're going to begin with some very important key points that took place so that you can make your decisions and you can also bring it to your pastors, bring it to the members within the church and prepare them for the second coming because our Savior is knocking at the door. He's knocking at the five wise virgins and asking them to wake up and search the scriptures with their phalanges, turning the pages time and time again, searching the scriptures for their life. Our Father who art in heaven, <clears throat> as we open up this message, we ask for your presence. And I ask that you help me to practice self-control with my words. In the name of Yeshua, we ask. And I'm asking. Amen. <clears throat> the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, B-E-M, Trinity. Have you ever been told the ship will go through? Stay on the ship. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant. Did you know that way before you were born, even before your parents were born, and for most before your grandparents were born, the Seventh-day Adventist Church went through a reorganization in 1904? It became what Alan White warned was a new organization that occurred would be formed. It was a prophecy that was given. It was a prophecy that has been fulfilled. And this is the prophecy that Ellen White gave. A new organization is referring to the new Seventh-day Adventist Church would be formed. It became the General Conference Corporation of the Seventh-day Adventists. This is what would become a blanted counterfeit of the original and real Seventh-day Adventist denomination or church. The early Adventist pioneers, and, and I want to stay here for a few seconds. The Adventist pioneers, brothers and sisters, are only eight men. And the young lady that was sitting in the midst was the prophet that was ordained and was anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the messenger of the remnant Philadelphia church. This is what she was organizing. It wasn't Alan G. White that gave the name the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was a group of women out in Michigan that organized and claimed and gave the Seventh-day Adventist name. But that name will continue until the second coming. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not starting a new church. It is the Philadelphia church that is being preached this evening and that goes home. And we are not forcing anyone. Our Savior doesn't force anyone. We just present the facts and have worship. And realize that we need to pray for one another. Because everyone, denomination or no denomination, we need to prepare and be holy, and go home. Can I hear an amen? Let amen. me continue. So, as he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ellen White gave counsel on this, 
We should have no union with the other Protestant churches. It is a grave mistake on the part of those who are children of God to seek to bridge the gulf that separates the children of light from the children of darkness. By yielding principle, by comp compromising the truth, it would be surrendering the peace of Christ in order to make peace or fraternize with the world. And this is what Ellen White was sharing with us right here. Ellen G. White, Review and Herald, July 24th, 1894. Now remember this date, brothers and sisters, because President Harrison back then also passed a National Sunday Law. Remember these dates and remember what I share with us. Now let us give us some scripture in regards to the Trinity issues. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Beginning with 1857. Now, let us go to the chart here. <clears throat> now, remember in our studies here, I ended with the year, November 22nd, 1892, when the loud cry was being presented, and it was rejected by the officials of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, let us return to the screen here, as I will share with us, and I will gently go forward a little bit and I will return back to this on the third study that we will be giving which is a little bit more deeper but I want to bring us down to present tense to where we're at so bear with me beginning with the year 1957 but we're going to go back a year we're going to go back to the year which is a half a century of apostasy <clears throat> this is from the year 1956 to 2006 this beautiful book of history with correct references, was put together by Mr. Colin Standish and Russell Standish. They have now gone to sleep, and their works do follow them. Bear with me. If you'd like to obtain the book, you may call us, okay? And there's another book. Now remember the dates, 1956 to 2006. Here we're beginning in the year 257. This will be presented in the third part. Also, there is another book which is powerful. The General Conference Confronts Apostasy, written by Russell and Colin Standish. Therefore, in this book, Elder Colin Standish put together a chapter in regards to the changes of the books. He only did a synopsis. He didn't do a thorough work. What I'm doing, or what we're doing, is that we're going all the way. We're opening up the pages, my brothers, the whole books. My life is an open book. I have nothing to hide. Okay? So bear in mind with what's being shared here. <clears throat> now, in reading and near hearing, the church declares oneness with the fallen Protestant denominations. We are one with our fellow Christian denominational groups in the great fundamentals of the faith once delivered to the saints. This is on Questions on Doctrine, page 32, 1957. Seventh-day Adventist Church joins, joins CWC, which is the abbreviation or, or acronym, Christian World Communions. Okay? Jesus, when speaking to his Father in John chapter 17, verse 3, said, This, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ. There's only two persons here, whom thou hast sent. Continuing, the church declares oneness with the fallen Protestant denominations. We are one with our fellow Christian denominational groups in the great fundamentals of the faith once delivered to the saints. In the year 1957, continue, Seventh-day Adventist Church joins the CWC Christian World Communions. I want to bring that to your attention, what occurred here, my brothers, okay? Because it's more than one. In 1961, while assembling... In New Delhi, the World Council of Churches declares the World Council of Churches is a fellowship of churches with, which accept our Lord Jesus Christ and God and Savior. The World Council of Churches was started in the year 1948 in Amsterdam, Germany. Okay? Now, soon this formulation gave rise to questions and requests for a clear definition of the Christ-centeredness of the churches. Plural. Richard. Common calling a more explicit expression of the Trinitarian faith. 
and a specific reference to the Holy Scriptures. Now, let me share this with you. I do apologize for that incident that hurt that took place, so let me continue. So, I'm building up what has happened. Now, bear in mind that by the year 1933, the Vice President of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, W.W. W. Prescott, emphasized and had already accepted the Trinitarian doctrine that comes from Rome. Not only from Rome, but it goes all the way to Babylon. Not only from Babylon, but all the way to the Babel Tower. Okay? There's a lot of history on this. But what I want to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, before I go on, because I want this to be here in our minds, the Trinity that is being exposed to us in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, beginning from the 1980, from the GC session with, with Neil Wilson, was that they had already accepted the Trinity. Now, in Laudato C, it is Sunday observance, 236, or 237, excuse me, the Eucharist, 237, and 238, referring to the Trinity. And there's another one, the Virgin Mary, who apparently is supposed to be in heaven and is alive. This is all coming from the Vatican Conclave of Cardinals. But it is an old law that was written in 321 A.D. with Constantine. Now bear with me in this matter. What I am trying to prove here, without doubt, and you may do your investigation, that what's been presented September 24th, 2015, is a Sunday law. This is what's been presented. And if you don't keep the Trinity, your tongue is going to be bored. You're going to be fined. Okay? But the phase here is that the House and the Senate and the members in Congress got together and put H.R. 9 together, specifically speaking of Laudato Si in disguise, which is climate change. What's behind climate change are three key points. Sunday observance, which is a national Sunday law that will be ratified. It's a blue law throughout the country. Number two is the Eucharist. Christ is not in that Eucharist. It's an abomination. He gave us communion service with the grape juice and the unleavened bread to eat for communion service and foot washing. But he says to us, you're not all clean yet. And number three, the Trinity. The Trinity is a Catholic encyclical letter command that has been given to the churches to accept. This is why everybody's accepting it. This is why the new Seventh-day Adventist Church accepted it in 1980. So they will not be called a cult so they would not be oisted. They had to come in. They were being forced. But that's in another study. Now, let me continue. By 1948 in Amsterdam, we know that soon this formulation gave rise to questions and requests for a clear definition of the Christ-centeredness of the churches, common calling a more explicit expression of the Trinitarian faith and a specific reference to the Holy Scriptures. In the year 1962, the Second Vatican Council begins to be held, concluding in 1965. Three years later, the Roman Church repositions itself in relation to the modern world. Major changes occur in the Catholic Church, but the intention remains the same. The final stage is set for the Jesuit order's counter-reformation to take over all the Protestant churches. And of course, there was a Jesuit that had passed away. His name was Alberto, Alberto Rivero. Alberto Rivero, may his spirit rest until the resurrection. Continuing in 1962, the World Council of Churches incorporates the Trinity Doctrine. Focus on the dates, my sisters. In its prerequisite for membership, the same prerequisite here is for the, was for the Seventh-day Adventist Church and becomes the foremost ecumenical organization in the world. However, continuing in 1965, at the close of Vatican II, General Conference President Ruben Figueroa arranges for Bert Beverly Beach. Bert Beach, everybody knows the name. To become the Seventh-day Adventist ecumenical liaison, with other denominations, placing him on an ecumenical board. This was a key doctrinal board of the World Council of Churches in Geneva. 
he would remain chairman of that board until he retired, until his retirement in 2000. He still lives in Silver Springs, my brothers and sisters, and he has asked me to take him off the mailing list, but I never took him off. So he's still receiving some of the information we are giving and reporting to his supervisors. By the year of 1968, in Sweden, World Council of Churches admitted to full membership representatives from non-member churches, which included the Seventh-day Adventist Church, published on July 12th, New York Times newspaper. By 1968, the Seventh-day Adventist Conference in Finland made a formal request to the General Conference for women to be ordained in the year 1968 into the ministry. 1970, Bert B. Beach is elected as the Secretary General of the Annual Conference of Secretaries of the Christian World Communions, which for represents about 2 billion Christians and covers more churches than any other organization. He would hold this position until 2003. By 1971, the Movement of Destiny by Leroy Froome, the Jesuit, gets published. Froome admits to alterations made from 1931 to standard works to correct erroneous views on the Godhead, here's the key, my brothers, Godhead, to make them Trinitarian. His historical account says, we began as semi-Aryans, but steadily rose to become a strong movement, able to take our place among mainland Protestant denominations. And we were never to barter or alter our views or compromise our doctrines in which this man was doing. Together with them, we wholeheartedly profess Christian's doctrine of the Trinity, mercy, and the full deity of Christ. He also makes other admissions of wrongdoing, which include going to Sunday keeping authors for his material, which he did. He was going to the Sunday keeping authors, Sunday theologians. That's where he was getting his information on the Trinity. Now, that is included in his book, The Coming of the Comforter. That was published in the year 1928, Movement of Destiny, 1971, page 322, 422. By the year of 1972, future General Conference President Jan Paulson becomes the first Adventist to graduate from Ecumenical Tubingen University. And everybody knows this is the Catholic denomination, Catholic Church, I mean Catholic School. By 1973, the General Conference set up a study committee to look at the issue of women's ordination. Now, here we come to 1972, years later, still discussing women's ordination. By 1973, uh, Bird B. Beach, Secretary of the Northern European, Europe, West African Division and Company, began social engineering of acceptance of being one with the world in joining the World Council of Churches. 1976, Neil Wilson, president of the North American Division, SDA, gives this sworn statement in the Silver Tubler legal case involving the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now hold on to your seats, my brothers and sisters, in reading and your hearing. Although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint, and the term hierarchy was used in a pregerative sense to refer to the papal form of church governance. That attitude on that church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of this century and the latter part of the last, and which has now been assigned to the historical trash heap so far as the Seventh-day Adventist Church is, a, is concerned. And here are your references, my brothers. This was a sworn statement dated February 6, 1976. Alan G. White warned in 1894, it is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Signs of the Times, February 19, 1894. 1977, Pope Paul VI rewards Bert B. Beach with his book with a private audience in the Vatican. Beach presents the Pope with a book and a gold medallion confirming friendship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church with the Vatican. 
The medallion is an engraved witness to the validity of the Ten Commandments, while the other commandments are represented simply as Roman numerals. The words of the fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, are written out. Beach represents the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church in an interview over Vatican Radio referring to the Pope as Holy Father. We don't do that. When Alan White has clearly warned the Pope is not regarded by God as anything more than a man who is acting out in our world the character of the man of sin represented in his claims that power and authority which Satan claimed in the heavenly courts. 5 MR 102 1978 February Ministry Magazine published a special 16-page edition on ordination, including several papers on a theology of ordination by Raoul Duntry, who I know, who was out there in uh, Illinois, who was a, well, I won't say, and Gottfried. And so, discussing the nature and, and mission of the church, they also discussed the role of women in ministry in the church. By 1979, W. Duncan, Eva, and Bernard Senton are working behind the scenes in moving an agenda to adopt a new fundamental beliefs. In 1980, General Conference, the World General Conference, in session in Dallas, Texas, officially votes to accept the Trinity doctrine. This was done all by Neil Wilson and his delegates and officials, but it took time to build up their premise. As part of the 27 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh day Adventist Church, by officially approving the Trinity, we realize that we have Seventh day Adventists believe on the seven, 27 fundamental beliefs, which are actually 28 fundamental beliefs today. Now, there is information in here that's correct, and there's information that's not correct. One of them is the Trinity, okay? That is the Catholic doctrine that has been represented. There has been much discussion on this issue. Now let me continue. I'm going to read it once again for clarification. In the year 1980, after much legal uh, legislation and much communication with the divisions and the unions in the World Church, the World General Conference was now ready in session in Dallas, Texas. Officially votes to accept the Trinity Doctrine as part of the 27 fundamental beliefs. Then, of the Seventh-day Adventists. By officially approving the Trinity doctrine as a fundamental doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventists, the denomination has publicly declared to the world that she is following in the steps of the daughters fallen churches of the Mother of Harlot. The Mother of Harlot, you know who it is, the Roman Catholic Church. And ladies and gentlemen, let me pause a minute here. Ladies and gentlemen, who I am referring to is the Roman Catholic Cardinals. It's the clergy. I'm not referring to the members of the, of the Catholic Church. They have nothing to do with this other than maybe vote here and there, yes, but it's the conclave of cardinals who does all the voting and all the agreeing in regards to what Paul Pontifus Maximus is proclaiming. The laws come from him, okay, no one else, okay? So we do have honest men and women in all denominations, and they have to realize that salvation is individually, and they, come out, they need to come out of the fallen churches. They need to come out of the fallen Catholic Church. It is not, nor has ever been, the church. It's not the remnant. It is a satanic conclave of cardinals leading blind people. Now, and reading once again, the steps of the daughters of fallen churches of the Mother of Heart, the Roman Catholic Church, whose central pillar doctrine is the Trinity. The Trinity. La Dato Si, which is common good, it was presented September the 24th in 2015. Congress, after hearing the rebuttals and the dialogue that he had given, and he spoke for one hour there in Congress, they turned around and wrote H.R. 9, which is climate change. And in climate change, it has nothing to do with Sunday observance, the Eucharist, or the Trinity. However, this is the second part that will be given when this law is passed by the president, then the Sunday observance will be proclaimed. There's your national Sunday law. The Eucharist deals with the with the with the the Omer that was represented 
on the 16th, this was the week of unleavened bread. This was the week when Christ was crucified. So when the priest would come out on the 16th, he would represent the omer, which represents the resurrection. Okay, so on the 16th, there was a resurrection. However, this represented also the wheat to begin to go and cultivate the wheat with a slip. That's in a study that's been given already. So therefore, Laudato Si is the encyclical letter that deals with all this. Laudato Si, in English, is common good. It deals with HR9, climate change. And in Laudato Si, you have Sunday observance, you have the Eucharist, and you have the Trinity. It's all compact prophecy in Laudato Si. Therefore, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has left the original mission proclaiming the three angels' messages of God's calling and the firm foundation of our faith, fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. No longer can the present Seventh-day Adventist Church be considered as the remnant. She had her time of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, but now simply a counterfeit new movement as prophesied in 1903 by the prophet Alan G. White. They are now ecumenical ready and compatible with the World Council of Churches. We now subscribe to a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is the exact belief that the early Advent pioneers removed themselves from in the year of 1840s when Alan White was alive and everybody knew it. All the pioneers knew it. And in 19, 1850s, when they left the fallen churches to form what would become the Seventh-day Adventists, not found anywhere is the second and third angel's messages. So what happened here, ladies and gentlemen, through this transition, through this whole transition, this issue on the Trinity was never preached, was never discussed, it was never held nor, nor obtained as a doctrine because they came out of the fallen churches. You see, the Trinity existed way back then. This is something that they believed. The pioneers, they didn't believe this. As a matter of fact, the members and the people, they knew this quite well. Let me continue. John says in John 4, verse 23, The hour is coming, and now is, present tense, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that's who he's looking for, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Jesus never said or alluded to worship the three in one true triune God, nor worship God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's only two seats in the Most Holy of Holies. The Father sits on the left-hand side, that's his seat, and the Son sits on the right-hand side because he earned it. There's only two chairs, two thrones in the Most Holy of Holies. And the menorah is inside the holy place that represents the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's symbolic. Let me continue. No, Jesus said in John 14, 20, My Father is greater than I. Okay, there he is. John 20, verse 17, Jesus says unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Revelation 3, verse 12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Can I hear an amen? amen. In 1980, the General Conference files on May 7th for a trademark of its name, Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist is a trademark now as a commercial entity. It is a corporation. The General Conference hires a Catholic lawyer to trademark various names, including Seventh-day Adventist, under the commercial law. This is the first time a Protestant church denomination appeals to the state for protection of their name. This move comes from former pastors and or leaders forming other groups bearing the same or similar name as a result of separating themselves from the apostasy that is happening within the main, the main body. They are therefore labeled as offshoots, movements as they attempt to hold to the foundation given to the original Seventh-day Adventist Church that transitioned from the movement, the Philadelphia Church. Before all the changes, 
the principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. Ellen White's letter, 242, October 19, 1903. How do you change religions? You change God's. 1981, Neil C. Wilson, General Conference President, announces that the church has officially adopted the Trinity doctrine, which is now number two in the church's 27 fundamental beliefs. So in your fundamental beliefs, the Trinity is doctrine number two, which is wrong, apostasy. Our Savior is not going to seal us in apostasy. Thank you. He declares before the Seventh-day Adventist Church that there is another universal and truly Catholic organization. This is what Neil Wilson says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventist Review, March 5, 1981, page 3. 1981, Adventist Review, July 30th, special issue on Bible doctrines. The Trinity Doctrine is explained one year after it was voted as an official doctrine, which was in 1980. It states, while no single scriptural passage states formally the doctrine of the Trinity, it is assumed, that's a sin to assume, my brothers and sisters, no pastor is to assume. As a fact, by Bible writers and mentioned several times, only by faith can we accept the existence of the Trinity. Page 4. The concept of the Trinity, namely the idea that the three are one, is not explicitly stated, but only assumed. Fernando L. Carnal, he, uh, Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology, Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia, Volume 12, page 138, Doctrine of God. He's a pastor in the church. 1982, Seventh-day Adventist Church signs the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, BEM document, from Spiritism in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Colin and Russell Standish, Harlan Publication, 1995, and Compilation of the Ecumenical Movement by Colin Standish, Every effort is being made to de-emphasize the great pillars of the Christian faith. We cannot forget the Congress that convened in Lima, Peru in 1981, in which almost all of the Christian communions of the world met, including a representative from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 1981, I was living in Darmstadt, Germany. While I was in Darmstadt, Germany, as I was walking to one of the other concerns to get some supplies, I happened to walk, and to my right-hand side was a Seventh-day Adventist church, an old church built by rock, very monumental. So this day I can reflect. I wasn't an Adventist then, but I can reflect to that old church where only maybe 20 people could fit in that, in that church. Now this was an old church, very historical. I wanted to present that. The representation of the Seventh-day Adventist church surely hit an all-time low in January of 1982. BM stands for Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry. This document of the World Council of Churches is the centerpiece of their determination to bring, to bring in a one-world order that has already occurred, October 31st, 2017. This is what the Conclave of Cardinals have done, my brothers and sisters. The one-world church has already been organized. 1984, Baptismal Vow, reformatted again. Pro-Trinity language. If you compare this version with previous versions from years ago, you, would have, you wouldn't recognize that this is the same denomination. 1985, a new church hymnal takes place, so all the church hymnals begin to take place to sing to the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't do that. That's a sin. No, we don't sing to the Holy Spirit. So once again, the place of the older attempted revised hymnals from the 1940s have been done away with. It was decided that there was even more songs that could be replaced or changed to fit the new 1980s fundamental beliefs. Catholic terms are used in headings and responsive readings. Lots of new ecumenical hymns have been added embracing what we would have considered in the past apostate terms and wordings. Besides praising a Holy Spirit, we embrace transubstantation and the Eucharist along with 13 new Trinity hymns. Mercy. By 1986, the official doctrine of the church is stated in the church manual. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co eternal persons. That's not true. The Holy Spirit is the power that the Father gave to His Son, and His Son gave it to humanity 
that it would convict them of sin and lead them in righteousness and in truth and lead them into the kingdom. That we may receive the early reign of the Holy Spirit that is intellectual knowledge. It's not about emotions, my brothers and sisters. The latter reign is definitely, nor ever will be, about emotions. It is intellectual knowledge, biblical truth. Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual, chapter 2, page 23, refer also to the book, Seventh-day Adventist Belief, 27 Fundamental Beliefs, The Trinity. 1988, Seventh-day Adventist Belief, 27 Fundamental Beliefs, book is published, strongly Trinitarian. And here you have Ellie Frome and many, many other individuals. Continuing with these men and women, I will not read them out. You can read them on your own time and play it back. 1990, at the General Conference session in Indianapolis, a Catholic priest spoke and prayed from the pulpit. The conference communications director told a local newspaper that we no longer believe that we did a hundred, what we did 100 years ago concerning the comments in the Great Controversy about the papacy, which is a condensed version of the Great Controversy, was handed out in Indianapolis by Shirley Burton, a spokeswoman, for the denomination, told the Indianapolis Star Daily newspaper the track was trash. The main body of the church has moved away from an anti-Catholic position. The new position of cooperation with the Catholic Church was exemplified by invitation from the Seventh-day Adventists to the Vatican to send an official observer to the conference. Mercy. 1991, May 2nd, issue of the Adventist Review, Roy Adams, editor, declares the World Council of Churches as, uh, assentation of the Holy Spirit and Eucharist fits into the ambit of the three angels' messages. Mercy. 1993, George Knight, a professor and prominent Seventh-day Adventist theologian, makes his starting confession in Ministry Magazine, October 1993. Most of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventists would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs. More specifically, most would not be able to agree to believe number two, which is doctrine number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity, which is part of the mark of the beast. 1994, William Johnson, editor of the Adventist Review, writes Adventist belief, beliefs have changed over the years under the impact of present truth. 1995, 56 General Conference, World Session in Utrecht, Netherlands. The Vatican flag is carried through the meetings. Hall, in a singular fashion, amidst an unusual loud ovation. The Pope and I descended from the same Father that makes us brothers who should not go around making personal attacks on each other. Mercy. 1997, Seventh-day Adventist logo is changed. This is the year, my brothers. The Seventh-day Adventist logo is changed from the three angels to flames and cross which is upside down, becoming Catholic friendly. This new logo is World Council of Churches friendly and has unifying marks within its design. I have been instructed to warn our people, says the prophet, for many are in danger of receiving theories uh, and sophistries that undermine the foundation pillars of our faith. 1999, B.T. Rice, pastor of the St. Louis Seventh-day Adventist Northside Church, addresses the Pope in a Vatican Mass held locally as Pope Your Holiness. This is what he called him. I remember watching the study. I cannot play with you tonight. In 2000, Ecumenical Gathering, the meeting of U.S. church leaders, an annual gathering of heads of Christian churches from around the nation, has elected Seventh-day Adventist Dr. Bert B. Beach. Everybody remembers this little guy. As the vice chair of the group's steering committee, there's the key right there, steering committee, more than 30 church leaders participated in the February 23 to the 25th meetings, including leaders from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, the United Church of 14 uh, Christ and the American Baptist Churches in the United States. Let me continue a little here. The Catholic side recognizes in the document of the Christocentric character of our beliefs and especially our belief in the Trinity as well as eschatological identity of the Church, a status affirmed by an act of the Polish Parliament. By 2001, September, the Adventist World Church created the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education. 
in September 2001 designed to provide overall guidance and standards to the professional training of pastors, evangelists, theologians, teachers, chaplains, and other denominational employees involved in ministerial and religious formation or spiritual formation in each of the church's 13 regions around the world. This is already past tense, my brothers. This has already happened. Adventist News Network feature article, Church Congregations Increase Focus on Spiritual Formation, February 3, 2004. In the next few years, con contemplative prayer and spiritual formation enter into our universities. In their teachings and are made prerequisites for theology degree programs. Okay, Now you can ask Derek Morris, who's in charge, the latest president of Hope Channel. So all this right here, my brothers, was a prerequisite to be a pastor or for the woman. And like they told me in school, they said, Richard, if you don't take spiritual formation, you're not going to be a pastor. Well, we, we ministerial students didn't know what to do. We got together, etc. And so I, I turned around and what I said was, okay, I'll go through it. But I've never used any of that trash. Remember this. Continuing, 2002, Vatican Rome, the Pope invites close friends to Assisi. The General Conference is on the short list to meet the Panta. As a result, the conference claps hands with the papacy. 2005, the Global Christian Forum meets. 2005, baptismal vow is revised in the Trinity. Creed to read, do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the Statement of Fundamental Beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge to live your life by God's grace in harmony with these teachings? Now, I don't teach this in baptism. For the first time in Adventist history, the church has based its membership on a creed. We don't live on a creed. The remnant doesn't live on a creed. The prophet had told us 120 years earlier, the Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. Review and held December 15, 1885. 2008, April 7th, Andrews University. 2009, Andrews University staff and students worship at a mosque in a, Okay, they take a the unusual position of bowing on the floor while repeating a, a worship chant to Allah. Mercy. 2014. Now everybody knows this man. Ganu Dip. General Conference Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty since 2011. Is elected as the new Secretary General at the Annual Conference of Secretaries of the Christian World Communions. Here, ladies and gentlemen, 2015 Huntsville First Seventh-day Adventist Church in Huntsville, Alabama begins to offer Sunday morning service. On February 8th, the First Church is less than two miles from the campus of Oakwood University. And Oakwood University is teaching so much apostasy that it has, it needs prayer, and I think it needs more than prayer, my friends. Maybe the school needs to close down. This is in addition to Sabbath service as an attempt to bring in unchurched community members. Spectrum Magazine, February 6th, 2015. And you know, just to go back a little bit, the brother that lives in Florida, he went to Oakwood University, his name is Enrique, and he has a ministry by the name of Save to Serve. And in Save to Serve, the man came out, and I believe, that, you know, he didn't know anybody, but he came out ignorantly, that there are no changes in the books of Alan G. White. Now, him and his wife, they have a lot of potential, and they're God's children. But we must lead people in righteousness so that he may make us righteous. We are not to teach error. Because error is not going to save us. Our Savior is going to save us in his purity and in his righteousness and through his baptism and by his holy blood. Error and truth is not going to come together and then he's going to save us. We're going to be sealed. It doesn't work that way. If it works that way, which it's not going to, then Satan has the same obligation to be saved in sin and truth. Is that correct? No. We don't want that. Because sin would be running all over the world in the new world, in the new heavens. No. It doesn't work that way. Now let me continue. 2015, Seventh-day Adventist Church, President Ted Wilson holds first meeting with the United Nations. Chief Secretary Ban Ki-moon on April 6th in New York City. Follow-up meetings take place in Silver Springs, Maryland, which is only 70 miles from here. Seventh-day Adventist Church Headquarters, the nation, the United Nations, is a cohort with the New World Order. There is no reason why we should entertain or meet with them thinking we can aid or steer their direction to a different course. Now here's where I, I wanted to meet with us. This is the meat of this whole process, my brothers and sisters. 
Please take notes. Our Father who art in heaven, bless this message. May you speak. May you be praised and glorified for revealing this to us at a time in these hours of history. Amen. 2015 General Conference Session unanimously voted, number one, the Antichrist Pope Francis I is no longer the Antichrist. Number two, the Pope Alan G., excuse me, the Prophet Alan G. White is no longer the Prophet of the Remnant. 2015 General Conference Session unanimously voted, <coughs> number three, the Testimonies Volumes 1 through 9, which books of a new order, these are books of a new order, printed in the year 1948, all nine of them, are not accepted in the Seventh-day Adventist Church any longer. The original books name are as follows. Testimonies, numbers 1 through 30. Those are the original books. Number 4, 2015 General Conference Session unanimously voted. Number 4, on or about October 24, 2015, Antichrist Pope Francis I attended Congress and presented encyclical letter care for our communion home, La Datu Si. And in La Datu Si, we got Sunday observance, the Eucharist, and the Trinity, which is the mark of the beast. La Datu Si, section 236, consists of, it is in the Eucharist, section 237, in encyclical letter, La Datu Si, on Sunday observance. La Datu Si, section 238, we must praise the whole Trinity, Trinitarian structure. La Dato Si, section 241, Mary, the mother who cared for Jesus, now cares with maternal affection and pain for this world. Now pay attention how it reads. This is how he wrote it. Carried up into heaven, she is the mother and queen of all creation. Bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that she is in heaven, but her spirit is asleep until the resurrection. She has not been resurrected. This is a false teaching. Here is your... H.R. 9, that has been presented and prepared by Congress, Representative Castro Cathy, Democrat of Florida, 14 introduced in February 27, 2019. House Foreign Affairs, Energy and Commerce Committee meetings is April 9, 2019 at 2 p.m. The committee reports uh, H. Rept is 116 to 161, uh, 41, Part 1. H repeat, and these are the references, my brothers. Uh, latest action, Senate. It's already passed the Senate second time. Placed on Senate. No, no. Excuse me. Introduced to Senate, May seventh, twenty nineteen. Read the second time. Placed on Senate. Legislative calendar under general orders. Calendar number seventy nine. All actions. So the roll call for votes takes place. There have been ten roll call votes. It is now passed in the House and passed in the Senate, and it is uh, being tabled in the Senate. It has not been passed and it has not been denied. But if it passes, then the president who is present, rather this president, President Donald Trump, or another president, they have 120 days to pass it. And because of all the issues and the impeachment that is taking place, the Democrats are pushing, who is actually the Jesuits, pushing towards Donald Trump, is taking the eyes off the Dato C so their eyes can be on the impeachment. That's another study that you can all hear. A. Our opponents sometimes claim that no brief, or excuse me, no belief should be held dogmatically, which is not explicitly stated in Scripture, but the Protestant churches have themselves accepted such dogmas as the Trinity, for which there is no such precise authority in the Gospels. B. As fundamental errors, we might class with this counterfeit Sabbath other errors which Protestants have brought away from the Catholic Church, such as sprinkling for baptism, which is an abomination, the Trinity, the consciousness of the dead, and eternal life in misery. The Mass who have held these fundamental errors have doubtless done it ignorantly, but can it be supposed that the Church of Christ will carry along with her these errors till the judgment scenes burst upon the world? We think not. James White wrote this. Review and Herald, uh, September 12, 1854, volume 6, number 5, page 36, paragraph 7. To stand in defense of truth as 
and righteousness when the majority forsake us to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test, my sisters and brothers and family and youngsters. Review and Hell, January 11, 1887. 2016, Gandhi Duke, pictured on the far right, which I don't have with me, I didn't want to put it in here. Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, World Church, attends the Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communions that was held in Rome, Italy. So the devil's using this man very much to bring in a lot of apostasy. Everyone in attendance greets the Pope. In total submission, in a sign of unity, Ganu claps hands with the papacy. In 2017, I will not discuss this at this time, however, in 2018, the members with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who no longer accept the 28 fundamental beliefs, would be disfellowshipped. And this is coming from the General Conference, down to the local churches, the divisions, the unions, and the members of the leadership. In 2019, the issue of abortions within the Seventh-day Adventist Church hospitals and members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church have been hidden from sight in the views of Christ. And there has been thousands, thousands of Seventh-day Adventist women that have aborted the unborn and committed murder. Pastor Doug Bachelor and Pastor Mark Finley have covered up what really happened here. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share a little bit what's happened here. There have been women that have been married and women that have been divorced and women that have been in the church that have been committing adultery or fornication. But the pastors didn't correct all this mess. They didn't give counsel because they don't visit the homes anymore. They don't visit the members of the church to see how their spiritual life and growth is coming about. So all these women in the Seventh-day Adventist church all over the world have aborted thousands and thousands and millions of babies which is a sin. They need to repent. The church leadership needs to get on their knees and they need to repent. Ladies and gentlemen, how in the world are we going to be a remnant that is purified by His blood and is interceding in the most holy of holies, preparing the people to give the three angels messages when abortion is being done before our faces and been covered up for years? Mark Finley stands up and is sitting down with a young man and he's being videotaped in regards to what the decision has been. Ladies and gentlemen, before we came into the church, getting married or having sex, having sex before marriage was a sin and is a sin. This is not supposed to be done. But when we come into the church, we see all these people who are drinking alcohol, who are going out on each other. Ladies and gentlemen, what has the church turned into? Sodom and Gomorrah? Are you telling me that they don't want to go home? Mercy on these women. Mercy on our church leaders, our pastors, the evangelists, and the families. May he find grace upon us all. The, and what I'm going to do here in closing, I'm going to be reading from the 1911, and I'm going to give a comparison uh, you find it in the 1884 Great Controversy, 405, paragraph 1, and the 1911 Great Controversy, 588. In reading, everything in red is what they inserted, and everything in blue is what was removed, which is correct. And what they put here is as follows. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to, of spiritualism. They will reach over the abbeys to clap hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. This is the 1911 Great Controversy, page 588. However, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, we read, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen? This is how it reads in the correct 1884 Great Controversy, page 405, paragraph 1. In reading and your hearing, everything in blue was omitted, my brothers and sisters. Okay, But this is the correct reading. Protestantism 
will yet stretch her hand across the gulf of spiritualism. Now, here it says the Protestants of the United States. That's totally incorrect. This is not dictated. Man wrote this. Here's how it reads. Protestantism will yet stretch her hand across the gulf of, uh, to, of spiritualism. She will reach over the abbeys to clap hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, our country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. This is being prophesied as I speak. The Justinian Code in 538 AD, by the end of the 4th century, the Trinitarians had power over the Roman Church hierarchy. Some of the Germanic tribes in the Roman Empire, such as the Goths, the Ostrogoths, the Herliai and the Vandals, this is who it's referring to, did not accept the Trinitarian view. And what they did to these three tribes, the Goths, the Ostrogoths, excuse me, the, and the, uh, the, the Herliai and the Vandals, they annihilated these tribes, my brothers and sisters. They annihilated them because they didn't accept the Sunday and they didn't accept the Trinity. This is the same premise and the same issue that will be happening now until the second coming. So if you don't believe in the Trinity, they're going to disfellowship you. And when that's done, when the Sunday law is passed, then they're going to look for all the people who are opposing these new laws, which are old laws. In the year 496 A.D., the Trinity was invoked in the baptism of Clovis, king of France, who not only adopted Catholicism as a well, as the doctrine of the Trinity, but through a series of military conquests, three tribes, referring to the Hurlia, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths of the Roman Empire, were destroyed forever. They don't exist anymore. In 538 AD, the third of these non-Trinitarian believing tribes, called the Ostrogoths, was defeated and destroyed and the papacy using the kings of the earth to uproot and enforce its law now had complete control of the Roman Empire. Number one, moreover, he who is an adherent of the Ni Nicene faith and a true believer of the Catholic religion should be understood to be one, page 10, who believes that Almighty God in Christ, the Son of God, are one person, God of God, light of light, and let no one by rejection dishonor the Holy Spirit whom we expect and have received from the supreme parent of all things in whom the sentiment of a pure and undefiled faith flourishes, as well as the belief in the undivided substance of a holy trinity. That is the Justinian Code. But what follows when the church gets complete control over the state? Persecution does. We made more from the Justinian Code or, me, excuse me, we read more from the Justinian Code as follows. Number two, let those who do not accept those doctrines cease to apply the name of the true religion to their fraudulent belief, and let them be branded with their open crimes, and having been removed from the threshold of all churches, be utterly excluded from them, as we forbid all heretics to hold unlawful assemblies within cities. If, however, any seditions outbreak should be attempted, we order them to be driven outside the walls of the city with relentless violence. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of Elohim, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Ezekiel 36, verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And this is Statutes 2707, permanently binding. It's in the feminine. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. This code was addressed to all the emperors across the empire. It was the law of the land. Belief in the Trinity was implicit. Imperial Rome, given power to the papacy, the dragon had given power to the beast, and it continued for 260 years, and after over 50 million martyrs, the wound of division was fully made by the sword of the state in 1798. When General Berthier captured the Pope, Pius VII, VI, and put an end to this suffering, we read, from an abridgment of the Christian doctrine of 1649 
Dies Solis, the day of the sun. Ladies and gentlemen, as we close on this study, I want to share with us <coughs> that there are two books that I'd like to emphasize. Gail Pippinger, I mean, Gail, uh, what was her name again? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, G.A. Uh, Ripplinger. Ripplinger, that's who I meant to say. There are two books. We do sell them. In Are We of Thy Word, a very powerful book. And then there's another one, uh, Hazardous Materials. So for a lot of you that have uh, various Greek and Hebrew and uh, lexicon books or, or other Greek and Hebrew books, you're going to find out a lot of information who put all these books together. There were secret society members that put these uh, concordances together in other books, Greek and Hebrew. And I think that you would be very well pleased in obtaining these books, that you may learn a lot more than what we know now. I could have put this out years ago, but uh, I'm just emphasizing them this evening. As we begin to close, ladies and gentlemen, my prayer is that you may grow in spirit and truth. This is part two. We will close with part three, and we will go more into depth in regards to the correct messages in giving the three angels' messages once again, and preparing for that fourth angel who is Yeshua HaMashiach to seal us and prepare us to give the message and go home and prepare for this Sunday law that is coming. Don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell, notifications. We also ask that you may also uh, prepare to listen to us throughout the broadcast that we will be having. Excuse me? Podcast. Podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, it's been a long week. Saving souls is not easy. May you be empowered with love this evening by your people. We ask for the baptism of your love upon us, blessings in the podcast that we will be having, and also we ask for your blessings and your guidance with the other guests that will be participating. We be we come before you and ask for your blessings upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We know that there will be a people that will come out that will be forming a remnant along with other members of other denominations. They will come out from all the Jesuit denominations. They will come out from all these schools that are falling. They will come out from all the Catholic denominations, all the Protestant churches, all the Mormon churches, all the Jehovah's Witness churches all the Episcopal churches, the Methodists, the Mormons. No one is perfect, Yeshua. We do this to bring to the utmost the attention of the nearness of the Second Coming. Bless us in republishing the books. Bless us in doing your work. Bless us in teaching and recruiting literature evangelistic workers in the United States as well as out of the United States and other third world countries. We ask for your blessings for the Spanish Great Controversy 1884 in preparation now to be printed, that it may be circulated, that the Spanish people all over the world may have a correct 1884 Great Controversy. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We claim John 14, verse 13 to 18, that if we ask anything in thy name and we present it to you, your highness, you will answer our prayers in your time. We love you. In the name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. <laughs>